So I guess the pandemic is over. Crowds of people are now perfectly okay, but only if, as Anthony Dillon described them, you are part of the renter crowd, who for the most part are completely ignorant of the issue they purport to be protesting about. Everybody by now has seen the footage of a cop who for more than eight minutes had his knee on the neck of a handcuffed George Floyd. That cop and three others now face charges ranging from second degree murder to aiding and abetting murder. But as I see protests around the world from Tokyo to Berlin to Sydney, I can't be alone in asking, what exactly are you protesting about and how is it related to the events in Minneapolis? I'm not going to cover what's happening in the United States, but I will say if you think looting, destruction of property and violence are the answer, you are the problem, not the solution. And I doubt whether you are actually interested in a meaningful discussion about curbing police brutality. I've made videos in the past about Black Lives Matter and their specious claims, so I'm not going to revisit that. You can click the links in this video, but I will restate this simple point. Any discussion of the disproportionate rate that black people are shot by the police in the US, whether armed or unarmed, is completely lacking in context if you don't include an analysis of the amount of violent interactions that same demographic is having with the police. Again, I presented this information years ago gathered from FBI arrest data, and it shows quite clearly that given the amount of violent crime African Americans are involved in, it's not surprising that they represent a disproportionate number of police shooting victims. Of course, that's not the only factor, but to omit it is to ignore the most important variable. This excerpt comes from an article published in the Wall Street Journal by Heather MacDonald, reprinted in The Australian with more up-to-date figures. Police officers fatally shot 1,004 people last year, most of whom were armed or otherwise dangerous. African Americans were about a quarter of those killed by cops last year, 235, a ratio that has remained stable since 2015. That share of black victims is less than what the black crime rate would predict, since police shootings are a function of how often officers encounter armed and violent suspects. In 2018, the latest year for which data have been published, African Americans made up 53% of known homicide offenders in the US and commit about 60% of robberies, though they are only 13% of the population. The police fatally shot nine unarmed blacks and 19 unarmed whites last year, according to a Washington Post database, down from 38 and 32 respectively in 2015. The Post defines unarmed broadly to include such cases as a suspect in Newark, New Jersey, who had a loaded handgun in his car during a police chase. In 2018, there were 7,407 black homicide victims. Assuming a comparable number of victims last year, those nine unarmed black victims of police shootings represent represent 0.1% of all African Americans killed last year. By contrast, a police officer is 18 and a half times more likely to be killed by a black male than an unarmed black male is to be killed by a police officer. Let that sink in. So back to Australia, where there were protests in every capital city, despite health officials warning against them. But again, what were they actually protesting? Well, a the theme that popped up at all the protests was the issue of Indigenous deaths in custody. You could see these types of signs everywhere drawing attention to the fact that more than 400 Indigenous Australians have died while in police custody. That number is since 1991, when the Royal Commission presented their findings about Aboriginal deaths in custody during the 1980s. In a recent article, The Guardian puts the number at 434 Indigenous deaths in custody over the last 30 years. Now, you might think that that sounds like a lot, but let me channel some Thomas Sowell here. Uh, I've often said uh, there, there are three questions that I think would destroy most of the arguments on the left. And the first is, uh, compared to what? Compared to what is probably the most important question you can ask when a context-free statistic is being thrown around. Otherwise, how do you know how to interpret it? Of course, the assumption of protesters is that this number is evidence of racial discrimination or in the language of critical social justice, institutionalized racism that is indifferent to the suffering of Indigenous people. But thankfully, the Australian Institute of Criminology published a report in 2015 to give this number some context. Let's start with some basics. The leading cause of death in custody, regardless of whether you are Indigenous or not, is natural causes. Accounting for 44% of the deaths in custody from 1979 to 2013, the last year the AIC has data for. Since the year 2000, natural causes accounted for more than 60% of deaths in custody, coinciding with a significant decline in the number of 
hanging deaths. In 2013, natural causes were cited as the cause in more than two-thirds of deaths in custody, with cancer being the most common natural cause. But more importantly to the claims of protesters, here are the rates of deaths in custody for Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike. Note that since the early 1980s, rates are similar. Sometimes Indigenous rates are higher than non-Indigenous, and vice versa. However, since the early 2000s, the non-Indigenous rate has remained higher than the Indigenous rate, and in the last two years for which we have data, the non-Indigenous rate is approximately twice that of the Indigenous rate. Put another way, in 2013, Indigenous Australians comprised 27% of detainees in prison custody, but were only 17% of deaths in custody. It's worth noting that this was the conclusion reached by the Royal Commission in 1991, that the high number of Aboriginal deaths in custody was due to the over-representation of Aboriginal people in custody, and that Indigenous Australians were no more likely to die in custody than non-Indigenous. Now, of course, when this is pointed out, you get the predictable response that yes, but Indigenous Australians are only 3 to 3.5% of the total population, yet are 27% of detainees. Surely this is evidence of a racist system. Well, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that the people in custody are there because they commit crimes. I know, it's a radical idea, isn't it? Despite what activists would have you believe, incarceration by reason of being Indigenous is not a policy of any Australian state police force. Another line of argument that attempts to explain incarceration rates of Indigenous Australians is that Indigenous people are being locked up for minor offences, for example, public drunkenness. However, this argument doesn't wash as demonstrated by David Biles. Biles was the chief criminologist on the aforementioned 1991 Royal Commission. In an article in the Canberra Times in 2016, Biles wrote, One of the myths surrounding this subject is the belief that most Aboriginal prisoners are incarcerated for minor offences, such as public drunkenness or traffic offences. There probably was some basis for that belief many years ago, but is certainly not the case today. A glance at the relevant data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics shows there is very little difference between the severity of the offences committed by Indigenous and non-Indigenous prisoners. The hard fact is that most of the Indigenous prisoners in jail have committed serious offences that would have had the same result if they were not Indigenous. And how about the idea that Indigenous offenders receive harsher sentences. Biles writes, Another fact that will not be welcomed is some research has suggested Indigenous offenders may be given lesser sentences than others. Certainly at an anecdotal level, several individual judges and magistrates will admit in private conversations that they look for a discount in the sentences they impose on Indigenous offenders. More research is needed on this sensitive issue. Why Indigenous Australians are incarcerated at such high rates, given their percentage of the total population, is a topic worthy of discussion. But waving placards and yelling racism is not the way to go about it. There's no great mystery here. Higher crime rates are correlated with social disadvantage. The usual factors are at play. Lack of education and employment opportunities, substance abuse and a generational history of violence. And not surprisingly, remote Indigenous communities suffer the most from these conditions. You address incarceration rates by addressing poverty and social disadvantage, not by waving placards and throwing around context-free statistics. As usual, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'll see you next time.